10,000 years ago, these giants roamed the earth. Then, tragically, the woolly mammoth went extinct. But now, after years of extensive research, we are able to bring these majestic creatures back to life. We then use publicly available data to identify the DNA sequence in mammoth. Then we continue to grow and multiply these cells, just as would occur in a mammoth thousands and thousands of years ago. Through the power of modern science, the world has been reintroduced to these ancient, gentle giants. And that's why we made this, the Mammoth Meatball. The Mammoth Meatball, it's huge. I never thought I'd be eating a meatball made of mammoths. Uh, excuse me, what? I have so many questions. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Food Theory and to Mystery Meat Weekend, where our programming is purely protein. In fact, we've got a full four-course dinner grilled up and ready to serve. Your appetizer, film theory, and the living meat of Vita Carnis. Your side dish, style theory's delectable deep dive into Lady Gaga's meat dress. For dessert, we've got Grandma's oddly savory murder pies over on Game Theory, but it's here on Food Theory that we're gonna experience the weekend's main course a wad of meat the size of a small child. And not just any meat, mind you. This giant chunk of chuck is made up of none other than a cloned woolly mammoth. Which I gotta admit, adds yet another entry to the insane list of topics I could have never imagined discussing when I started these channels. That said, nothing truly embodies the spirit of Mystery Meat Weekend quite like this giant brown ball. Sorry, I missed the memo that apparently we're cloning mammoths now. We're just wadding them up and throwing them into a big old meat glob, yeah? <sighs> like seriously, I have all the questions. How? Why? And most importantly of all, what does this thing actually taste like? I mean, when you get the internet a buzzing about bringing prehistoric woolly mammoths back from the dead only to create something that belongs on a plate of spaghetti at the Rainforest Cafe, you know that your boy MatPat is gonna be making a video about it. So grab a knife, a fork, and probably plenty of Pepto, cause today we're taking a bite out of a 10,000 year old meatball. Let's start with the who and how of this thing first. You see, an Australian company named Vow recently revealed that they'd created a spicy meat ball made entirely from extinct woolly mammoth meat. Which begs the question, how do you do that? You know, when there aren't exactly many of these guys walking around nowadays to hunt and cook up. Well, that's where our good pal science comes in. You see, humans have actually found woolly mammoth carcasses frozen in ice before. And no, before you ask, these meatballs aren't made from rancid thousand-year-old meat found buried in the ground. I mean, it's called the five-second rule, guys, not the five-millennia rule. No, what those carcasses carcasses contained was a small amount of DNA. DNA that contained basically all the instructions needed to build yourself a brand new woolly mammoth. Except here's the best part. We don't need to bring back the entire woolly mammoth to get our meat fix. All we need is the instructions for making one very specific protein in that woolly mammoth, myoglobin. You see, myoglobin is one of only two proteins in your body designed to transport and store the oxygen that you breathe in. The other one of these two proteins is probably the one that's a lot more familiar to you guys watching at home, hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is found in your blood, myoglobin is actually found in your muscles. You know, the stuff that you're eating when you consume a steak. So Val scoured all of the available data on woolly mammoth DNA until they found the gene that codes for making mammoth myoglobin. Then they filled in some of the missing gaps with African elephant DNA, the closest living relative to the mammoth, and boom, just like that, you got yourself some meaty mammoth myoglobin ready to go. Talk about your fast food. Or, uh, should I say your past Food. ba -doom ching I'm here all week. It's meat weekend, ladies and gentlemen. From there, the only thing missing is a host to help grow and replicate the cells. Now, natural host would be the elephant. It's the closest ancestor, so it should probably be the most receptive to getting the prehistoric myoglobin. However, just inserting man-made genes into other organisms is actually a pretty complicated process. So the animal chosen to serve as the host was actually a sheep. Yep, this jumbo ball of meat is actually the weird hybrid of sheep, elephant, and mammoth DNA all mixed together. Sheep are just one of the animals that we've been inserting artificial genes into for years. We've even taken the genes from jellyfish that make them bioluminesce and inserted them into sheep to get the most disturbing nightlight you can imagine. No, you're not seeing things. Science literally made a glowing sheep. That's right. In an episode all about how they cloned a mammoth in order to make a prehistoric meatball, the meatball is not the strangest thing that I'm talking about. The day glow sheep is. Humanity, man. We go to some weird places. Now, I should call out for ethical reasons 
reasons they didn't insert the gene into a baby sheep and then raise it to have mammoth meat like some sort of Frankenstein's monster. Instead, for our mammoth meatballs, they used sheep muscle cells, then inserted their mammoth DNA and then grew the cells in the lab until they had enough mammoth meat to form into a ball. What ended up being created was several billion muscle cells that have 99% mammoth myoglobin, and therefore should be about as close to mammoth meat as humanity has seen since the Ice Age. And according to the creators, the meatball has itself a very unusual and pungent odor. So that's something. Super fascinating to think that adding the protein from an animal that went extinct 4,000 years ago gave it a totally unique and new aroma. Something we haven't smelled as a population for a very long time. But forget about the smell. Clearly what we all want to know is how this thing tastes. Humanity is for the first time in 4,000 years able to experience the unique flavor of mammoth. So what is this stuff like? After years of extensive research, the mammoth meatball is finally here. Yeah? Yeah? So what's the flavor? The mammoth meatball, it's huge. I never thought I'd be eating a meatball made of mammoths. Yeah, I get it. Just stop hyping it up and tell me the goods. What's it taste like? The creators say they haven't even tasted it. Who knows what kind of allergens could have existed thousands of years ago. Wait, so... I can't believe this. So they didn't eat it? What happened to the whole, I never thought I'd be eating a meatball made of mammoth quote? If you're not gonna try it, then what's the point? Instead, this experiment was to generate buzz around the possible environmental benefits of creating meat. So it was all a press thing? They cloned a freaking mammoth and all it was was a publicity stunt to raise awareness about their actual business, which is creating lab-grown meat and no, not mammoth or dinosaur fun meats, but instead normal things like chicken and beef. Boo. Never Never before in all of human history has someone been so disappointed. And that someone is me. Come on, Val! The first rule of doing internet food science is getting that coveted shot of you tasting your unholy creation and then getting your live reaction. That's delicious. It's fan! Fantastic. You have to risk it to get the lab-grown biscuit, my friends. So, with the scientists too scared to take the mammoth meatball challenge, I guess it's up to me to answer the question that we all really want to know the answer to. What would this mystery mammoth meat actually taste like? Science be damned, I want to savor the flavor. So let's bust out our hypothetical fork and knife and dig in, shall we? As we just discussed, the mammoth meatball is made from myoglobin, and myoglobin contains red pigments called hemes. These hemes are what gives meat, like steak, its character characteristic red appearance, but the hemes in myoglobin are also what contribute heavily to the meat's taste. Every animal has itself a slightly different kind of myoglobin, each given its own distinct flavor. So if we want to make a meat that tastes like mammoth meat, then we need to find our closest approximation to mammoth myoglobin. The closest living relative to the mammoth is the modern-day Asian elephant, which has smaller ears and less wrinkly skin than the African counterpart. However, the African elephant is more often used for its meat, so there's more information that we can dive into there. Now, let's just get to the elephant in the room, or I suppose the lack of an elephant in the room. You might be wondering why we haven't procured any elephant for ourselves to try after I gave Val Flack for not trying their creation. Well, that's because elephant meat in the US is super illegal. There are protected species due to a slew of issues ranging from their slow reproductive cycles to the ivory trade decimating entire elephant populations. In short, world governments aren't too keen on us munching on these incredibly intelligent creatures. So yet again, I am thwarted in my quest to understand what the mammoth meat would actually taste like. Come on, guys, I just want a lick of snuffleupagus is all I'm saying. Is, is that so much to ask? Now, despite elephant meat sending you straight to jail here, there are a few scientific ways of figuring this one out. For one, elephant meat is incredibly high in iron, having 46% more than beef. Elephant is also surprisingly lean, with a similar fat content to pigs. It's low in cholesterol as well. In fact, the list of health benefits of elephant meat goes on and on. Potassium, vitamin C, zinc, even more protein pound for pound than any other animal product. It's no wonder that people in Africa have been eating elephants for hundreds of years. Accounts from those who have tasted elephant meat have said that it tastes like venison, essentially just the meat of a young deer or elk. This makes a lot of sense considering both deer and elephants are herbivores that, in the wild, get a fair bit of exercise. But because of the more varied diet consisting of nuts, fruit trees, shrubs, and grass, elephant meat is actually supposed to be stronger and more complex in flavor than that of deer. Remember, though, that this episode is talking about mammoths and not necessarily 
elephants. Mammoths typically stuck to a strict diet of grass, with flowers thrown in here or there every once in a while, meaning that their meat would fall somewhere between deer and modern elephants on the robustness scale. Basically, their meat would be very gamey. So what's gamey mean? Well, gamey meats have a more earthy smell to them as well as a more pungent flavor. These are your wild game meats, like if you're eating venison, elk, or wild boar. Basically, eating mammoth would be an acquired taste. The other important factor in determining the flavor, though, is the amount of iron in the meat. As I mentioned before, mammoth is high in iron. Bison is another meat that's also high in iron levels, which gives it a taste that many people describe as earthy or minerally. So it's safe to assume that the mammoth meat would have that similar earthiness. Coupled with the fat content, Content that's similar to a pig, you've got yourself a gamey, heavy mineral flavor that tastes a bit like pork liver, but with a texture that's similar to venison. But I gotta say, the worst part of your mammoth meat experience is gonna be trying to chew it. You see, elephants, and mammoths for that matter, get a fair amount of exercise. In general, their muscles are used quite a bit, especially to bear their massive weights as they get older. And in the food world, more exercise equals tougher meat. That's why Wagyu cows live in a stress-free environment and are constantly looked after to make sure they don't exercise all that much up until they're slaughter. This allows the meat to remain as fatty and tender as possible. Mammoths weren't the nomadic creatures that we once thought they were, which means that they wouldn't constantly be walking miles upon miles, but in the wild they'd still be getting a good amount of exercise lugging around anywhere between 4 to 10 tons of their own body weight. They also had themselves a lifespan that lasted around 3 times that of your typical cow. And since early humans had to actually hunt these things in order to feast, more often than not they'd be more likely to kill an older straggler from the herd than the younger members of the group who were staunchly defended. That meant that whatever mammoth meat humans were consuming back then, it was likely the oldest of the old, which, you guessed it, makes the meat even tougher. Imagine chowing down on a four inch thick slice of beef jerky that smells like minerals, but vaguely of pork. Well, that tooth breaking experience is something along the lines of eating mammoth meat. That's why elephant meat today is often slathered with sauces, to make the eating of it a more pleasant experience than just exercising your jaw. And just to make things clear, it would be twice as bad if we were talking about the trunk here, which is an appendage made out of pure muscle muscle that's just constantly used by the mammoth for moving objects like fallen trees, fighting other mammoths, and delicately picking flowers. Aww. This constant use would actually render the trunk hard as a rock when it came to cooking, and even though it'd be rich in flavor, it would be the toughest jerky you'd have ever had. Nearly impossible to get down. And here, my friends, is the ultimate twist. The fact that Vow made this stuff into a meatball, well, that was probably the single best way to serve a tough meat like this. You see, grinding up meat like this and presenting it in a ball form is probably the best way to take down any cut that's gonna be tough and sinewy. That said, if they wanted to truly go the extra mile here, instead of just baking it and then finishing it off with a torch, they should have actually slow cooked this thing in a broth. In fact, if we were ever to widely adopt mammoth meat into our daily culinary lives, it would most likely be in a slow cooked stew or soup. The hot liquid would over time break down the collagen and connective tissue that binds the muscle fibers, thereby making it fall apart more easily. And with all the other flavors typically infused into a stew, the meatball would lose some of its pungency, its exotic smell, and overall just become much easier on your palate. In fact, this is a very popular way for people to enjoy venison and other gamey meats like rabbit nowadays, so it would make sense that mammoth meat with its similar taste profile would be enjoyed in much the same way. So is all of this just a hypothetical discussion then? Well, no, actually. You see, woolly mammoths going extinct during the Ice Age meant that some of their frozen bodies were found in incredibly good condition as recently as the 1900s. One found in Siberia was so well preserved that it actually had grass still in its mouth. Of course, humans being humans, eager to eat just about anything we come across, the meat was served up in 1901 as part of a mammoth banquet. And apparently it was a moderate hit, with guests claiming that it was, quote, agreeable, and also, quote, not much tougher than some of the meats furnished by butchers of the time. An absolutely glowing review. And so there you have it, friends. Possible lethality of an Ice Age protein notwithstanding, we now have ourselves a solid idea of what munching on a mammoth meatball would taste, feel, and smell like. So thank you all for tuning in to Theorist Meat Week, which has hopefully been easier to swallow than the mammoth meatball. If you've yet to ascend to the level of king or queen of the meats, make sure you continue onward to our film theory on Vita Carnis, one of my all-time favorite analog horror series that we've ever watched. But hey, did you know our sponsor for today's episode is Guardio? It's the browsing extension that acts as a first line of defense when you're scrolling through the web. Guardio blocks almost all online threats before they have a chance to wreak havoc on your computer and private information. And believe me, with the rabbit holes that we go down here at Team Theorist, we definitely need some to protect us, because sometimes following our ideas lands us up in some uh, questionable territory. You try researching mammoth meat for hours on end and see where you wind up. After hours and hours of staring at my monitor, or just exploring very suspicious websites, it's easy to accidentally
accidentally click on harmful links. And if it weren't for Guardio's fishing block, my identity would have probably been stolen a long time ago. And nobody wants that. Another map pat running around creating chaos. Be horrible. And with so much of our personal information these days being stored in browsers like passwords, addresses, top secret theories, it's important to have a product like Guardio, which blocks a hundred times more harmful sites than Google and other competitors, and ten times more malicious downloads than any other security tool. And unlike all those other guys, Guardio ain't waiting for the malware to be nestled into your device. I personally use it to help keep my information safe whenever I browse. I also have it on my phone to help keep me updated on real-time leaks of any services that have my accounts on, which, in this day and age, hoo-wee, it happens a lot more often than I'd like. Honestly, I used to think two-factor authentication was enough, but the more I learn, the more it seems like having a dedicated product like Guardio is a must. Also, did I mention that you can start with a free 30-second security scan? And just because you're a theorist, you can get yourself 20% off the monthly subscription if you use guard.io slash food theory so you can start protecting yourself and up to five of your family members. You know, just so you can make sure that your parents are safe when they go surfing the web to play some text twist and they open up an email that claims they've inherited millions of dollars from a prince in some far-off land. So, if you want a clean and secure browsing experience, again, go to guard.io slash food theory. Link is in the top line of the description and check out their affordable premium plan for full protection. Thank you again to Guardio for being the sponsor of today's video and as always, my friends, I'll see you next week.